de Guiva Cordial there. Thank you very much, Deirdre, and thanks to Stephanie and everybody in Kolov for the opportunity to come and, and speak to you uh, today. Um, I'm just going to talk from the heart. I'll talk from a few notes and uh, hopefully the insights that maybe I share with you and the experiences uh, might be helpful and I'll, be, I'll join the panel afterwards as well so that if there are questions as well you want maybe clarification on I'll stay around afterwards for the reception. Uh, I'll be happy to do that. Um, Derry mentioned that uh, I grew up in, in Derry and uh, the one thing that uh, we're well known for in Derry as well despite the troubles was having a good sense of humour. So I remember once uh, when we had Bishop Tutu uh, he would always start with humour, give his message and end with hope. And I think it's a great way to, to plan out a speech. So uh, in view of that, uh, I want to just tell you a story about um, the orange man who died and went to heaven. And uh, he knocked at the pearly gates and Peter opened and he was about to walk in. And Peter said, hold it, this is not the Gavahi Road, you just can't walk in here. <laughs> Free will, he says, I'm going to determine whether you're suitable for here or not. So he said, I'm going to ask you two questions. And what you've got to do is think very carefully because your mortal destiny depends on it. He says, the first question is, did you ever do anything spectacular in your life? So the orange man immediately said, I did. Since I was a wee boy, I took part in the orange parades, 12th of July. Sash my father wore, big bands, bunting, lambic drums, bonfires the night before. He says, they were pretty spectacular. So Peter says, hmm, not overly impressed, but I'll let it go. But he says, the next question now, is really important, so think carefully before you answer. I want to know, did you ever do anything brave or heroic in your life? And quick as a flash, he said, I did. I once walked down O'Connell Street in Dublin, in Dublin carrying the Union Jack. <laughs> Peter says, jeez, he says, that was brave. He says, when did you do that? And the orange man looked at his watch and he says, about two minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, There was, what was the other one I was thinking about? Um, was Ian, it'll come to me maybe later on, so it might be a way to finish off anyway. So anyway, I grew up in Derry. Derry had a very profound effect on me um, in terms of the whole issue of discrimination, uh, of injustice, of the denial of human rights. And obviously that would have opened my mind up to uh, the struggle of other people. And of course, the civil rights movement in Derry was very much influenced by the black civil rights movement in the United States and indeed the student protests in Paris around the end of the 1960s. So all of those kind of global influences and the, the movements to end colonial um, powers in various parts of the world were all been fed back into Derry and were, were obviously influencing people. But one of my most profound influences was really my mother. My mother was a very compassionate woman and she introduced me when I was a child to um, a Belgian missionary called Father Damien, he's known as Father Damien of Molokai. And uh, I remember being very, very inspired by the story of this missionary who volunteered to go to the island of Molokai to deal with uh, Hawaiian people who had been thrown onto this remote island because they had leprosy and the fear of leprosy. And it was uh, an extraordinary um, just community of suffering and of hopelessness and many people were afraid of leprosy, they didn't understand at the time, they didn't have a cure, and Damien volunteered, and uh, it was what Damien did. You know, he, he realised that the lepers who had been abandoned in Molokai had brought with them their same dignity, their same skills, their same hopes and dreams that they'd left behind in their home, homeland islands uh, in the Kingdom of Hawaii, and he began to forge a community. You know, he knew that there were people still with skills of, of um, woodworkers, uh, people with music, people who were builders and so on, and he got them to come together and he transformed that society. And he himself contracted leprosy 10 years later and four years after that, 14 years after he went to Molokai, he died of leprosy. And uh, I remember being very, very moved by that. And, uh, you know, it's now when I look back, I realise like, that Damien was really the first hero I ever had. And many of the choices that I made afterwards were really because I was very moved by just the compassion of, of Damien of Molokai, who was a simple Flemish, from a simple Flemish farming background and uh, made a great impact. And in fact, I, I did a book uh, last year 
called the, the Prophecy of Robert Louis Stevenson, because Robert Louis Stevenson was a great uh, admirer of Father Damien, as was Gandhi. And uh, he actually defended Father Damien against a, a vitriolic attack uh, after he had died and so on. So just inter interesting, the, the different influences. And, you know, we're at a period as well in Ireland where there's a transformation and there are many things in terms of particularly the Catholic Church that we are deeply ashamed of, and particularly like the abuse of children and the cover-up of the hierarchy. And uh, that has to be challenged and that has to be rooted out and the light has to be shone on it uh, so this never happens again. It's also important we realise too that you know, in all of the churches there were good, very good men and women who were themselves transformed by their encounter with people who were struggling for human rights all over the world. And indeed some of the great movements in Ireland, you know, that began in the 60s and 70s, uh, came from that movement as well. I mean, Concern Worldwide, which is one of the greatest humanitarian organisations in the world, and one that we as Irish people can feel very, very proud of, I mean, grew out of the, the Holy Ghost missionary movement. Uh, AFRI, the organisation that I was director of uh, for 14 years, uh, was started by an Irish missionary called Father Sean McFerrin, a Salesian. And, uh, you know, Concern Universal, who is the British equivalent of, of Concern Worldwide, again, came from the same roots. Concern America, the same roots. Children in Crossfire um, is an organisation that has the same roots from Concern as well. Um, so, just interesting, all of that. And, uh, and those organisations gave me and gave other people the opportunity to really work in the whole development sector. And, um, and I think it's wonderful that we have them and they need to be supported and indeed there's opportunities available in volunteering through them, with them or working for them and so on. Um, a little bit about the work I did with, with AFRI. Uh, I think one of the realisations, and it was particularly coming down to Dublin to do the development studies course, was interesting how all of the uh, paths are crossing today because I was probably one of the earlier uh, students on the Kimmage Development Studies course and it wasn't a professional degree at that stage and I didn't have an MA available at that stage. You got a diploma but it wasn't a recognised diploma. Um, but it still was a wonderful grounding on, in development education and certainly if anyone has a space and would like to maybe deepen their knowledge of development issues, I would really recommend the, the Kimmage course. Um, Joe Murray, who is now the coordinator of AFRI, uh, I actually suggested to Joe that he should do the uh, Cambridge course, and then Joe later suggested to Paddy Riley that he would do the Cambridge course, and Paddy Riley is now the director of Cambridge. <laughs> well, it's just amazing like, how all of those little things interconnect. And so that's why as well, don't be afraid to network. Don't be afraid to say to people, I'm really interested in this. If there's ever an opportunity, or if you see an opening, maybe you keep me in mind. Because that's what happened with Richard Moore. Uh, I did a walk. I organised it in 1982, 1492. Uh, it was for the 500th anniversary of the so-called discovery of America. And uh, so <coughs> we went back and we walked from Oklahoma back to Mississippi along the Choctaw Indian Trail of Tears. And the reason being was these Indians helped the Irish during the Great Famine. In fact, there's a plaque out there which we uh, in Africa put up in 1992 to commemorate the, the humanity of the, of the Choctaws. And Richard Moore did that walk, and I, as we would be walking, Richard was blind, he would link on to me, and I would talk a lot about my enthusiasm for this work, and he said, God, I'd love to do this. And uh, around the time I was working on the book on Bloody Sunday, I was asked by the chairman of Concern Universal if I would uh, help them to set up in Ireland. And uh, I said, look, I'm doing this book, I've kind of moved on, I'm doing, pursuing another career. I said, also I feel a bit burnt out. I could do the job, but I think you need somebody with more enthusiasm. And I said, I'd like to recommend Richard Moore. And so he contacted Richard, and Richard got the job. And Children in Crossfire is now about 11 years old, so it's just amazing. So never be afraid to say to people, you know, keep me in mind, or if you see an opportunity, maybe you'd put a good word in for me. Because those things certainly do do help and they certainly do work. Um, I think the power 
of Afrif, and uh, perhaps one of my gifts is imagination.